Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are continuing our studies in 1 Thessalonians, and we're coming to the end of the fourth chapter. And as Mark said, coming to the end of our study, because we have one more chapter and two lessons in that. But our lesson this morning is 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. Paul has completed a section, verses 9 through 12, on the responsibilities we have right now. It's kind of mundane in a sense. Uh, work with your hands, mind your own business, be productive. That's very much the Christian life. But now it gets into the future. And the next paragraph, beginning with verse 13, so it goes from the mundane to what we might call the exciting Verse 13, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve, as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain... Until, his come, until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time in, in it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. When Paul's letter arrived in Thessalonica, the church must have received it with eagerness. Paul praised their faith and service, but all was not well. The Thessalonians were in grief. Some of their members and family had died, maybe due to persecution, maybe due to natural causes, but they were wondering about what kind of future the deceased had. When Paul first came to Thessalonica and the, the church was established, he had taught them about the future and the Lord's return. He mentions that in the, the next chapter, the passage we'll look at next week, in verses, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. It, it's uh, what he calls in Titus 2, verse 13, the blessed hope and what we are to be looking for. The Thessalonians were doing that. Paul noted that early in the book in chapter 1 and verse 10. He spoke of how they were waiting for God's Son from heaven. But what about their loved ones? Was the blessed hope a hope for them? That was the worry. In fact, doubts may have begun to weaken their hope. Uh, they were waiting for the Lord, and, but while they waited, their members died. The world persecuted them, and the Lord didn't come. Was it a false hope or a hope not for their lifetime? Was waiting and looking futile? Doubt is one of the devil's most effective devices in frustrating a believer's faith and resolve. And in this case, regarding Christ's return, the result is believers begin to be spiritually uh, lethargic, and instead of being watchful, they become unwatchful and spiritually indifferent. Paul knew human nature, and he knew that might be a problem, and so to prevent that from happening and galvanizing spiritual wakefulness, he reminds the Thessalonians of the hope of the Lord's return and answers their worries. They wondered what would happen to their deceased friends and loved ones if Jesus returned now. Would they lose out on the events of that great day? Paul answers that in 
our passage, chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. And he tells them that believers who die before the Lord's return won't miss anything. They will be part of it, right in the thick of it. Paul knew how disturbed they were about this, and he shows heartfelt concern for them in verse 13 when he calls the Thessalonians brothers. It's an expression of genuine affection. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Notice Paul doesn't say we don't grieve. Of course we do. Jesus grieved when he stood before Lazarus' tomb and wept. John 11, verse 35. But it's not the sorrow of the world which is hopeless. There's a letter from the second century that gives some sense of Paul's meaning. A woman named Irene, a pagan, wrote a couple who had suffered the loss of a son, and she tried to comfort them. She recalled how she wept when Didymus, her son, had died, so she could sympathize. She understood what her friends were going through, but she said, against such things one can do nothing. Therefore, comfort ye one another. It was well-meant counsel, but it was counsel of despair. It was without hope. The end comes, we can't avoid it, so comfort ye one another. But how? With what? Now that's the best that the world can offer. A stiff upper lip, a kind of stoical resignation to the inevitable. But it's not hope. The world doesn't have that. It does not have hope. And so it dreads death. It often avoids the very subject of death. Christians sorrow when loved ones die, but we have hope. And it is based on a a solid historical foundation. Paul gives that in verse 14, the death and resurrection of Jesus. Paul says, we believe in both of these events that Jesus died and rose again. And the reason we believe that is because the scriptures teach those great truths. In 1 Corinthians 15, which was written after 1 Thessalonians, but expresses the ground of this belief, Paul begins the chapter with the basics of the Christian faith. He writes of what he received, that is, what he received from Christ, and passed on to the Corinthians and to the Thessalonians. And it was Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. The Old Testament was the scriptures of the early church. Uh, It is scripture for us today. The Bible, Old and New Testament alike, is our authority for faith and practice. Now, is that a reasonable foundation for our beliefs? Yes, completely. These events, the death and the resurrection of Christ, were prophesied in the Old Testament. They both occurred as prophesied and were also verified by many witnesses. Paul speaks of that. He says, in addition to what has been revealed to us, are there 500 witnesses that over that, that could testify to everything I've said. And he says, some of them are still alive, and if you want to do some research, go talk to them. So our faith isn't in legends, it isn't in myths, but it is grounded in history and in facts. Christ died, he made atonement, and then we're told he was buried. Now that, that is one way of saying he really did die. There was no swooning or any of the modern theories that tried to account for the resurrection. He really did die, but I think there's also a suggestion in there of the nature of his death because when Adam sinned, God told him, from dust you, you from dust and to dust you will return. And so when our Lord died, he was placed in the tomb. He was buried, as it were, in the dust, which is a symbol 
of the curse. He himself was not corrupted. He himself did not turn to dust. But that association reminds us that he bore the curse for us when he died and was buried and suffered that humiliation of burial, but it was overcome. He was raised from the dead. And what that tells us is his sacrifice, his death was a sacrifice. It was a sacrifice for our sins. He bore our curse and God was satisfied with his sacrifice for all for whom he died. And God accepted the sacrifice for us and that was confirmed when God raised his son from the dead. That's the proof that the sacrifice has been accepted. So through faith alone, we're saved. Through faith, we're justified. We're declared right with God. And our Savior is alive. What a great truth that is. We have a living Savior. And knowing that to be true, we know that He will also come back. We know also, as Paul says, that when He comes back, God will bring with Him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. When he returns, he will bring with him believers who have died. So, the saints that preceded us or precede, preceded them or precede us in death won't miss anything. They will be part of the Lord's return. That is the encouragement that Paul gave to the Thessalonians. But we shouldn't miss some of the details that Paul gives us here that are very encouraging, like the way Paul describes the dead. He doesn't describe them as dead but as asleep. That's Paul's way of speaking of Christian death. It wasn't limited to him. Jews and, and Greeks at this time also used the word sleep to describe death, but Paul made that his own way of describing Christian death. It is sleep, not soul sleep. It doesn't mean we enter into a state of non-consciousness, uh, a spiritual coma, the dead are completely conscious in heaven and active, and you see that as you read the book of Revelation, chapter 6 and 7. And yet he describes this condition as sleep because sleep is rest. And that's what we enter into, rest. That's pictured, I think, in burial. Laying the body in the tomb is like lying down in bed at night, and we rest, but we don't rest permanently. We await the sunrise and rise to a new day, and that too is what the dead in Christ will do. They lie, as it were, waiting the rise of the sun, rise, awaiting the, the coming of the Lord when they will rise up. So this is our condition when when we go to be with the Lord, when we die, we don't suffer the pains of death. We rest. We don't dream. Heaven is real. It's a joyful place. It's an active place. And that's where the dead are at the present time, but not permanently. Because Paul says they will return with Christ and their souls will be joined to their resurrected bodies. They'll be transformed. And then... That's what Paul writes of and explains in the next verses, verses 15 through 17. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Uh, uh, this isn't speculation on Paul's part. This is revelation. The, the certainty of what he said here is given in the words that introduced the statement by the word of the Lord. It's what Christ said. Christ gave instruction on this. Now there's no record of him saying this in the Gospels of the book of Acts. There, is, there was no doubt lots of these unrecorded sayings that the Lord gave, such as Acts 20 verse 35, it is more blessed to give than receive. There's nowhere in the Gospels that that quote is found, but this is one of those, uh, an example of what's called a logion, uh, a statement that is attributed to Christ but not found in the Gospels. And here we have one, and there have, uh, no doubt there are many things he said that were not recorded. We know that from 
what John wrote in John 21, verse 25 of his gospel. There were many things that Jesus did and said that were not recorded in the gospels. All the books in the world, he said, couldn't contain them if they were. And this is probably one of those. At some time, some place, Christ said that the dead will precede the living when he comes. Paul's statement, we who are alive and remain, has suggested to critics of the apostle and critics of the New Testament that Paul thought that he would be alive when Christ came and that he would escape death and that all of this would apply to him and those of his generation. But of course, it didn't happen. Paul was wrong. And this hope of the coming of the Lord is really just a fantasy. And the church should give it up. Well, that is finding far more in his statement that, than is really there. In fact, finding something in his statement that's not there at all. Paul did teach that Christ's return was imminent, that it could happen at any time. It is an abiding hope for Christians. That doesn't mean, though, that Paul believed it was going to happen soon or even in his lifetime, just that everything was in place for it to occur. For example, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, John wrote, Children, it is the last hour. In other words, the stage is set. All is fulfilled. And we are living along the edge of that hour, as it were, when the final events will unfold. And we may suddenly enter that hour. It could happen at any time. F.F. F. Bruce wrote, In the Christian era, it is always five minutes to midnight. But we don't know when that will happen. We don't know when the clock will strike. Paul didn't know. He was speaking generally here. He indicates in, in chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, that, that we don't know the, the time of the Lord's return. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 14, he states his expectation of rising in the resurrection of the dead. He seemed to plan for his death, anticipate that. Paul's concern here was pastoral. It was to ease the Thessalonians' worries by showing that the, the dead would not be disadvantaged when the Lord returned. The date and time of the event is known to no one, not even to an apostle. What is known with certainty is that Jesus will return. And we need to be ready for it. And I think that too is one of Paul's concerns. So in verse 16, he gives the, the manner in which it will happen. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Paul says three things here. First, that it is the Lord himself who will return. The second person of the Godhead. The second person of the Trinity. The return of Christ will be divine intervention in history. This is literal. A literal coming. Secondly, he states that the coming will be glorious. Christ will be accompanied by angels and, and great sounds, angelic voices, shouts, and trumpets. The trumpet had a, a military function in Israel. It, it sounded a call to battle, but it had other uses as well. It, it signaled the Hebrews' encounter with the Lord at Mount Sinai. Trumpets were blown, and that... Uh, critical event, that important event in Israel's history happened. As also, the trumpet was also used to announce the times of the festivals, the feasts in Israel. But whatever the meaning, there will be a glorious and instructive sounds accompanying the Lord's return. Maybe shouts that the saints are to come up. 
The third point is that the faithful dead will depart first. Their bodies will be raised. What disturbed the Thessalonians was the fear that their departed loved ones would, would miss the event. No, they will be the first to rise. Verse 17 then tells us, we who are alive and remain, then we will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. That word caught up is used in Acts chapter 8, verse 39, of Philip being snatched away from Gaza after baptizing the Ethiopian eunuch and finding himself at Azotus, which is ancient and modern day Ashdod on the Mediterranean coast. So he's there in Gaza and suddenly he's caught up and he's translated to another place. And that's the same word that's used here. Now Paul didn't know if he would experience that. But that's the hope that he had and that each generation has. It's a great hope and an exciting thought that we could escape death, the last enemy, when suddenly being snatched away to meet Christ and the saints in the sky, we're raptured. That's what this is about, the rapture of the church. It's taught here. But what Paul was really in encouraging the sad saints of Thessalonica with was the hope of reunion. We will be caught up together with them in the clouds. The separation of loved ones caused by death is only temporary. Either death reunites us or the Lord's return will. But we will be together again and forever. What a great thought that is. Death separates us only temporarily. And, and, and what he wants us to know is that we will be not only with them, but what he focuses on is with the Lord. And that should be what really thrills us the most. Well, at the graveside, there is nothing more encouraging than that. This is one of those texts that I often read when we do the graveside service because it's an encouragement and a great hope. And that's really what, as Paul, how Paul sees it. And it's what he, he says. He ends the chapter by telling them all, therefore, comfort one another with these words. All of this is stated in no uncertain terms. It's straightforward and clear. What's not so certain is when it all happens. Is this before, during, or at the end of the tribulation? Paul describes the tribulation in chapter 5. It's the day of the Lord. It's called the great tribulation in Revelation 7 verse 14. It's the seven-year period of calamity and persecution when there'll be the rise of the man of sin, the Antichrist, and all of that will take place during that period of time before the Lord's second coming. So when will this happen? Now that's not as easily answered as some other questions because Paul doesn't say. So Bible students are left to make their conclusions by drawing inferences from the text. So let me consider the question of when the rapture of the church will occur in relation to the tribulation. The church will either go through the tribulation or be raptured during the tribulation or before the tribulation. Now those who argue that the, for the church going through the tribulation or for what's called a post-tribulation rapture, a rapture after the tribulation, point to the Lord's teaching on His return or second coming in the Gospels. The, the word Paul uses here for His coming, parousia, the Greek word, is the same word that Jesus used in Matthew 24. And a, a description of it is very similar to the one Paul gives here. Let me read this. In Matthew 24, verses 30 and 31, Jesus said, 
And then the sign of the, of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds. From one end of the sky to the other. So the sounds and the signs are the same. He will come with trumpets and on clouds. And it is then that the elect are gathered as they are here in Paul's teaching. In Matthew, this is the second coming at the end of the tribulation. This is when Christ will defeat the Antichrist. In 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8, Paul says that he will slay him with the breath of his mouth. He'll simply speak and he'll be destroyed. Paul did not write explicitly of two parousias, two comings. And so it's natural to assume that what he describes here is what Jesus described in Matthew 24. Post-tribulationists put, uh, put the rapture at that time. Christ will not take the church away from the tribulation, but when he returns, he will meet them in the air as he's coming down, and they will come out to meet him, as it were, and then accompany him back to the earth where he will slay the wicked and establish his kingdom. Pre-tribulationists put the rapture before the tribulation and explain it as being a deliverance from that time. Now that's the view that I hold, and I hold it for a couple of reasons. First, I think the context of the book favors that view, very much so. We saw earlier in chapter 1, verse 10, where Paul spoke of the Thessalonians as turning from idols to serve the living God, and he says, he speaks of how they were waiting for Christ from heaven, who, Paul wrote, rescues us from the wrath to come. Uh, when, when we think of God's wrath, we naturally think of hell. We think of eternal judgment. But as we, consider, we, as we considered a few weeks ago, you may remember, the idea of damnation has no support from the context of this book. That is, hell is real, but that's not what wrath means here. That's not the idea. Christ's coming isn't to rescue us from hell. He did that at his first coming on the cross. This is something different. This is a deliverance not yet accomplished, one in the future. And the way it's translated here is he rescues us from the wrath to come. But this could well be translated, who will rescue us, who will deliver us. A future tense. So what is the wrath from which he will rescue us? It's what Paul writes of in the next chapter, in chapter 5, where he describes the, the worldwide calamities God will bring on the earth in judgment. And there Paul says in verse 9 of chapter 5, God has not destined us for wrath, meaning for the day of wrath on the earth but for the obtaining of salvation, deliverance, through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is, is what he will rescue us from when he comes. Paul calls it the day of the Lord, which is prophesied all through the Old Testament. He says that men will be saying, peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly. The day of the Lord will begin either the seven-year period of tribulation or the last three and a half years of it. The book of Revelation describes it in far greater detail. And there, in Revelation chapter 6, we have an interesting passage that I think bears on to all, all of this. After the sixth seal is broken, unbelieving men know what has happened. They know what's going on. And they cry out in horror and terror. But they don't cry out to the Lord God. They don't cry out in repentance, just the opposite. They, they, they cry out to the mountains. They pray to the mountains and the rocks to fall upon them and hide them from God and the, the Lamb 
For, they say, great, the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Well, the word for wrath there in Revelation 6 is our word here in 1 Thessalonians. There will be no deliverance for them, for unbelievers, but there will be for the church. Christ the Lamb will rescue them. That rescue is what is described here in chapter 4, verse 17, with the rapture of the church when the trumpet will sound and the saints will be caught up in the clouds to meet Christ in the air. It's what Paul taught in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 and 52. We will not all sleep, he says. That is, we're not all going to die. Some will escape death. And all will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. I think the context of 1 Thessalonians makes it clear that that will happen before the tribulation. And secondly, there's also support for that from the matter of the issue of imminency, that the Lord's return could happen at any moment. Paul said in chapter 1, verse 10, that the Thessalonians were waiting for it, anticipating it. And that's the hope given in Titus chapter 2, verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. We're to be looking for His appearing. A post-tribulation rapture doesn't allow for that. Seven years of tribulation have to precede the Lord's return. And that has to happen first. And I think that's also a problem with the mid-tribulation position. But again, having said that, each position is based on inferences. The apostles didn't state the time when the rapture would occur in relation to the tribulation. I think we need to bear that in mind. Be careful about how certain we are or dogmatic we are on such a thing. It's not a question of orthodoxy, this doctrine. Each view has faithful Christians as exponents, some great men on each side, particularly on the pre-trib and the post-trib view. And each view has the hope of the Lord's return. The question is, which view best meets the criterion of Scripture? And I think that the promise of 1 Thessalonians, that the church will be rescued from the wrath that will be poured out upon the earth in the day of the Lord, in the end times, is assurance that the rapture of the church will occur before the tribulation. And that means that we have the expectation of the Lord's any moment return. Paul had taught it to the Thessalonians in the brief time that he had with them, which I think is very significant. We've, I've mentioned this many times, I think. He was probably there two, maybe three weeks or less. And he spent a lot of time on eschatology, on the future events. He makes that point at the beginning of chapter 5. And that indicates the importance of these things, the importance of this doctrine. And so we are to be waiting and watching, not, of course, to the exclusion of our daily duties. That, that was the warning of the angels to the disciples when Jesus ascended into heaven from the Mount of Olives, those uh, there couldn't take their eyes off the sky, and I can certainly understand that. I wouldn't have been able to either. But even when he disappeared into the clouds and was gone from view, they continued looking up as though he would make, come back. So the angel said to them, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? You need to be about the business of the work of the church that's about to be established. And so they go back to Jerusalem and they dedicate themselves to that ministry. And 50 days later is the day of Pentecost. And uh, not 50 days, but a few days later is the day of Pentecost when the Spirit is poured out. And they, they worked year after year living out the Christian life, being productive in the world. Still, in all of that, they were looking for the Lord's return. 
That's how we are to live every day, living with the hope that he's coming again and he may come soon. I don't think our problem today is looking into the sky. Modern Christianity has played down the doctrine of the Lord's return and the rapture of the church to its own loss. The book of Revelation is filled with this hope. The Lord said to the church of Philippi, or the, I'm sorry, of Philadelphia in chapter 3, verse 11, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that no one will take your crown. He repeats the promise twice at the end of the book of Revelation in chapter 22. Yes, I am coming quickly. And John answers that with the words, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Many people have seen a link between John's statement at the end of the book of Revelation and Paul's statement at the end of 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 16, verse 22, Maranatha. It's an Aramaic expression meaning, O Lord, come. That was the, the hope and prayer of the apostles and the hope of the early church, a church that suffered persecution for its active faith and longed to see its Savior. Come, Lord Jesus. Is that your longing? Is that your prayer? You want to avoid the tribulation, I'm sure, but is that really your great hope, or is it to see the Lord and be with Him? Or is your prayer kind of like that of St. Augustine? When he was a young man, his mother was a believer, and no doubt she took him to church, and she prayed for him, and she talked to him, and he knew, he knew some things. He just didn't believe, but he did pray. and had this famous prayer, Give me chastity, but not yet. <laughs> so do we pray, Come, Lord Jesus, but not yet. Life is good. We have plans, things we want to do, things we want to see Maybe after the Super Bowl. I think our attitude toward the Lord's return for His church is indicative of our spiritual condition. It's easy to get caught up in the world and, and grow a little cold to the things of the Lord and then lose the excitement of His, of his soon coming or, our, our, or of our seeing Him. Our hearts need to be kindled. Our hearts need to be set aflame. And really the only way that will happen is by reading the Word of God, putting time into the Word of God. You remember those disciples in Luke 24 who met the Lord on the, uh, the, the road to Emmaus and He visited them and suddenly disappeared when they realized this stranger was the Lord and they said, did not our hearts burn while He taught us the Scriptures? That's how your heart's going to burn. It's through the Word of God. And considering texts like this, we're to be engaged in this world and in the Lord's work in it. We're not to be standing idle, looking at the sky. But belief in the Lord's return and the thought that He might come tonight is incentive to work. Time is short. Salvation is close. When he comes, may the Lord find us living responsibly. As Paul instructed those Thessalonians to live in the previous paragraph, leading a quiet life, working with their hands, minding their own business, being productive and living to his glory in the moment. Paul's words in this passage are, are pastoral, not sensational. They were to clear up confusion and, and comfort grieving Christians with the promise of reunion with loved ones and with the Lord and victory over the world. Christ is coming and He's bringing His saints with Him. Death has not disadvantaged them. They will participate in the Lord's return and we will all be reunited in the air and for all eternity. So Paul says... Comfort one another with these words. And that is the greatest comfort. We will be with the Lord and His people forever. The world 
cannot offer hope of that kind. In fact, the world cannot really offer any hope beyond the moment. I think of that letter written almost 2,000 years ago by that pagan woman, Irene, attempting to give comfort to a grieving couple. I wonder if she agonized over things before she wrote, wondered, what kind of comfort can I offer them? She could offer sympathy, but she could not offer hope beyond this life. So she wrote, against such things, one can do nothing. In other words, face up to fate. Therefore, comfort you one another. What despair. How blessed we are, we Christians, and how thankful we should be. We have eternal life through Jesus Christ. And he's coming back to take us to glory. Maybe tonight. It's five minutes to midnight. But regardless, we all have an appointment with eternity. Every one of us. Where will our appointment be? If you've not put your faith in Christ, it is in eternal judgment. Flee that. Come to Christ. Believe in Him. He delivered those who believe from God's justice. Receive His forgiveness and the gift of eternal life through faith and faith alone. Become a child of God by believing in the Son of God. May God help you to do that. Help all of us to set about to live a life of service to Him, redeeming the time, anticipating His soon coming. Why don't we end with a hymn from the Songs of Praise book, number 24. O oh, my soul, arise and bless your Maker, and then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number 24. Father, we've spoken of uh, the blessed hope, the hope of your son's return, and we look forward to that. We should. It's also true he's with us now. Every moment of our life, Christ is with us. Your spirit is in us. What a great truth that is. But certainly someday, as we just sang, we will see him face to face. We'll be transformed. This life is brief. May we live it to your glory, knowing of the hope we have and the certainty of it. We thank you for that. It's what you bought for us through the sacrifice of your son. We thank you for him, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.